My name is Dr. David Dukas, and I am the director of the program in medical ethics and human values. And we are also the um, academic unit where there is a master of science program in bioethics and humanities I'll be mentioning in a second. First, I'd like to tell you about the a uh, great pleasure that I have in an, um, introducing our speaker today as part of the J.R. Williams Senior MD Class of 31 Endowed Lecture Series. So this is a wonderful opportunity for Tulane to bring in all kinds of speakers related to spirituality and health, but also medical ethics and humanities at Tulane University School of Medicine that was started by Dr. Williams' son. Um, the focus of these lectures is intended to draw on the art of creating a compassionate and trusting relationship between patient and physician. And it honors the legacy of Dr. Richard Williams, who was a Tulane University graduate and a well-known and well-loved internist and oncologist in Selma, Alabama. Next slide. Dr. Williams loved medicine and was the kind of doctor who would do anything for his patient with an interest in the impact of spirituality on health, particularly on the positive impact of spirituality on the well-being and continued health of those who have suffered the loss of a loved one. Next slide. Part of the reason for that is because of the fact that a lot of oncologists wound up doing palliative care before there was a specialty of palliative care. And as a result, particularly back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, he was having to do a lot of palliative care for patients who were advanced in their uh, cancer care. The other thing that I wanted to introduce to you all was the Master of Science program in Bioethics and Medical Humanities, who co-sponsors this talk. We are very easy to find on the web. All you need to do is put tulane.edu slash bioethics. And we are also at YouTube. Again, very simple to find. Just put in Tulane Bioethics and you'll come straight to us. Next slide. So there's an informational video that was pre-recorded and is easily found. You can either point your uh, cell phone camera at the QR code that's right now on your screen, and that will populate a Safari link to take you there by way of YouTube, or a bit.ly link, which is bit.ly, and then two capital M, M-U, three capital U, capital X. Pick your, your best way of getting there. Next page. So our MS curriculum has two uh, tracks, one in bioethics, which is looking at teaching research and service in hospital ethics committees and IRBs in all healthcare settings, and in conducting normative empirical research in healthcare ethics. The medical humanities track focuses on the teaching or research on those aspects of narrative, reflective writing, fine arts, and history as applied to healthcare history being the focus today. Next slide. We have uh, all kinds of options for people to participate. We have a two-year post-baccalaureate MS program. We also have an integrated dual degree MD MS program for those currently enrolled or enrolling at Tulane University School of Medicine. And we have a flexible faculty development option for mid-career professionals. Next slide. So if you have any questions, feel free to contact Dr. Hansen, who is our Director of Graduate Studies at shansen4 at tulane.edu, or Sophie Offengenden, who is our Program Coordinator. There was a quick wave there from Stephen. And again, you can always come to our web link at tulane.edu slash bioethics. Next slide. The course that Dr. Ledoux is teaching next semester is the history of medicine on health maintenance, disease, beliefs, and therapeutics that'll be explored from antiquity until the mid 20th century. 
It's definitely worth your participation. Next slide. Thank you. So I'm very pleased to make the introduction of Dr. Elma Ledoux. And Dr. Ledoux is the Associate Dean of Admissions and Student Affairs at Tulane University School of Medicine. She holds the Peterman Prosser Professorship here at Tulane and teaches the History of Medicine course in our Master of Science program in Bioethics and Medical Humanities. A Tulane graduate and cardiologist by training, Dr. Ledoux serves as a clinician educator at every level of medical school education. Dr. Ledoux was selected through a peer review process for membership in the Tulane Health Sciences Center Society of Teaching Scholars and is the recipient of the Tulane University President's Medal for Excellence in Graduate or Professional Education. Her areas of interest in the humanities include the history of medicine and World War II history. And as a result, she is currently enrolled in a master's degree program in World War II history. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce today the J.R. Williams Sr. MD31 endowed lecturer, Dr. Elma Ledoux, speaking on commerce, chemicals, and social customs intertwined hazards of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Dr. Ledoux. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dukas. I, I appreciate that introduction. And I'm very excited to be here today uh, with all of you. I think, you know, history is just uh, an amazing topic that for medical students and uh, those in the healthcare field in general, sometimes um, we forget about the value of history uh, when treating patients and also when having to uh, make ethical decisions regarding patient care. So what I'm gonna do today is talk about uh, the interaction between uh, chemicals in everyday life in the 19th and early 20th century and how their use was affected not only by commerce but also by social customs. If you think about the Industrial Revolution, uh, particularly uh, at its full peak in the 19th century, we think more about hazards related to major accidents, such as would be the case with the railroad industry or with the steel industry. And that's very true in terms of sudden mortality. But what I wanted to talk about today is a little more insidious and I think a little more interesting because it involves the, the interdigitation of all of these factors. Now, as we go through these vignettes, I want you to think about these relationships. And just consider that industry operated in search of a profit and responded to demand. The industrial workers came from the poorest classes and didn't have the financial means to leave their jobs. And because the vast majority were coming from an agrarian society coming into the city, they also lived in close quarters and had uh, access to very poor hygiene. The working conditions and the compensation for the injured workers were poor. There was no incentive and no laws at the time to protect them. And as consumers, people brought, bought the products that were made if they wanted it, and for the most part did not question its safety. Consumers purchased products that were in vogue to reaffirm their social status. Now, many of these have toxicities that have been known since antiquity, but they were only rediscovered after problems developed. Physicians of the time generally recognized the causation, but the public and the industry either didn't believe them or chose not to believe them because it would affect profits or availability of that product. And again, regulation was slow due to the cultural adoption of the product. Once people had it, they didn't want it regulated or taken away. So the 19th century hazards that we're going to discuss today are those involving coal and soot exposure, radium, white phosphorus, mercury, trinitrotoluene, TNT, arsenic, aniline and benzene, and lead. There are many others, 
but we only have an hour. So I've limited to those that I think are, are uh, quite interesting how they played out. The first I'd like to talk about is the disease of chimney sweeps. It was referred to back then as soot wart. It was recognized that those who had been chimney sweeps for a few years would generally develop uh, skin sores and also obviously respiratory complaints from inhaling the soot. How did this come about? Well, in the time of the Industrial Revolution, instead of burning wood, people turned to coal as a source of fuel and the coal tar when burned would leave sticky residue in the chimneys. This had to be cleaned out or the flue would become blocked and the smoke would back up into the houses. And that led to the development of specialized workers called chimney sweeps to get down in there and do the cleaning. Now, because the passageways are narrow, children as young as four years old were put down into the chimney uh, to clean it. And if they were too slow, they would literally light a fire under them, which is where that expression comes from, to get them to work faster. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, later chimneys began, began to be a sign of social status. So if you had moved up through the middle class and you now had social status, you might have more than one chimney in your home. In the UK, well, in Britain back then, they began to tax people according to the number of chimneys they had. So they got around this by connecting all of the fireplaces to one chimney by an elaborate co connection of uh, uh, tunnels that the children then had to crawl through in order to clean it properly. So this was not only dangerous work, but work that only a child could do because they're the only ones small enough to fit through. Well, it was determined after a few years that so many of these children and the adults as well develop skin cancer, respiratory problems, and this specific type of problem called a soot wart that was actually squamous cell carcinoma of the scrotum. And it was first described by English orthopedic surgeon Percival Pott in 1775 and uh, it's really an effect of, of going down into the coal fireplaces. And this was alarming uh, to lawmakers. And they did pass a Chimney Sweepers Act of 1788 so that no children under eight were allowed down in the chimneys. Now, this came with some uh, exclusions. All it meant was that if you were under eight, you had to have parental consent and you couldn't be taken from an orphanage, say, to do this work. Well, you're talking about the time of Dickens, and of course, uh, the majority of people were so poor that they had to depend upon their children to bring in some income. So that really didn't curtail the number of children working as sweeps. Finally, by 1875, after a number of deaths, uh, that occurred in kids, they finally passed uh, No Child Sweepers Act. Ultimately, in 1922, it was found that carcinogens were in that soot, specifically polycyclic hydrocarbons, which can cause DNA damage, which then ultimately leads to cancer. Now, the sweeps uh, didn't fade until the 1960s with the use of natural gas. Now, going back a little bit, you wonder, okay, well, why did the squamous cell carcinoma, uh, why did it so specifically affect the scrotum and the sweeps? And it has to do with the soot going down into their underwear and the force of gravity pulling everything down into uh, the perineal area and having direct contact with scrotal tissue. So, uh, so many of these young boys uh, ended up having to have extensive urologic uh, surgery to remove the cancer, which often had metastasized up uh, into the rest of the GU tract. Now, my, you might ask yourself, well, you know, why would anyone continue to be a sweep? You know, why would they do this if they knew by 1922 that uh, this was a carcinogen? And I'll deflect it out to the 21st century. 
why do people continue to smoke cigarettes when in 1960 the Surgeon General determined that cigarettes smoking causes cancer and again it's the idea of there's a need and someone fulfills it or somebody wants something and it gets ingrained in the culture. Fortunately, while cigarette smoking was uh, uh, used by oh, over 50% of men in the 1950s, it's now down nationally um, around 17%. So we have made progress, but not as much as you would think. And again, it's the same idea. We have the same uh, human nature hasn't changed any. Now, the next one that I want to talk about is a little more obscure. This is radium exposure from painting clock hands at the U.S. Radium Corporation. You could think, wow, you know, is that really a thing? Well, it really was. It was first described by a dentist, Dr. Theodore Bloom, in 1924. And like so many of these cases it involves young women who were employed in factories the men did the rugged work outside on the railroads or in the steel mills and certainly they had their share of accidents the women had more uh, chemical exposures because they worked very closely with uh, the tools and the objects that were potentially toxic or known to be toxic so they'd hire young women to paint use uh, using uh, paint brushes dipped in radium to paint the dials of the clock and also the numbers on the clock so they would glow in the dark. And this was a big thing because consumers wanted this. This was the next big thing. It would be like if um, the first iPhone had been released. Everybody wants something new. So these young women uh, were told that the uh, Radium was completely harmless and that to get a nice fine point on the paintbrush, they should lick the paintbrush and bring it to a point so that they can, uh, you know, very discreetly put the uh, radium on the uh, clock face. So unbeknownst to these young women, the radiation exposure caused damage to the bone closest to where they had ingested it, which would be the teeth and the mandible, the jaw. And they also had gingival swelling. This brought on terrible pain. Many of them thought they just had a toothache, but this particular dentist began to notice a pattern. And this uh, uh, radium corporation denied any liability, but he made the, the relationship between their employment and this osteonecrosis and infection that they had in their jaws so the radium girls put together a suit and this was made into a movie a few years ago worth watching but the radium girls uh filed suit and by the time it came to court some of them had such radiation sickness that they literally had to testify from a cot in the courtroom because they were too weak to stand up and it was settled out of court ultimately in 1928, but not before the radium company appealed. The appeal was denied. They took it to the Supreme Court and uh, the Supreme Court just refused to hear it. So ultimately these young women were awarded in today's dollars, approximately $100,000 each for their death or disability, whether it was paid out to the heirs or to themselves. And this is an example of what happened to these women uh, this um, really attractive young woman ended up with um, uh, a huge abscess coming from uh, the, the necrosis in the jaw, and she ultimately died. This shows the women working on the clock faces here, what, what very uh, detailed work it uh, involves. And the interesting thing here is after all this happened, radium was not withheld for its uh, luminous effect it was continued <laughs> on the clock faces only under uh, uh, conditions of greater safety where the women did not put the paintbrush in their mouths and they didn't directly handle the radium so the consumer still wanted the goods and so the show must go on they just made it uh, a little bit safer and so you might ask yourself, 
well, if, if they knew radiation was dangerous, why would they continue to use it? And again, I'll put it to the 20th or 21st century. We knew that it was dangerous, but in the 1950s, it was a marketing tool to go into a shoe store and stand on a platform and your feet were x-rayed inside your new shoes so you could see how well they fit. Additionally, even in the 21st century, we have people that go out um, um, for extended periods of time or over time using tanning beds which is known different type of radiation, which is known to cause cancer. Uh, the American Academy of Dermatology said that uh, with the use of tanning beds, the incidence of melanoma has increased by 20%. The incidence of squamous cell carcinoma of the skin has increased by 67%. And basal cell carcinoma and other type of skin cancer increased by 29%. And yet human nature people still continue to use tanning beds, even though they know that it carries some risk. Not to be outdone with radium dials, radium water was marketed as a cure-all. Radithor had a patent on this. It contained one millicurie of radium and one millicurie of mesothorium. And it was purported to cure everything from rheumatism to impotence. And as is the case with so many uh, illnesses, if a high profile person or a celebrity develops that illness, then it gets more attention. And that led to the demise of Radithor because socialite Eben Byers, who was uh, really kind of a celebrity of his day back in the 30s, he was a a golfer and a socialite and um, really a, a celebrity of the day believed in Radithor and ingested so much over time that it killed him. He died of radiation sickness. At the time of his death, he was so radioactive, he had to be buried in a lead casket. And that was the end of Radithor simply because it had killed someone famous and therefore no one wanted to have anything to do with it uh, anymore. Now the story of the 19th century match girls is really fascinating too. Uh, if we think about matches, they seem to be something that's always been with us and certainly way back of uh, the Chinese had uh, tapers coated with sulfur that they could put in a fire in order to bring the fire elsewhere. But we're, what we're talking about here are matches, striking matches that would allow flame to become portable. And if you think about the culture at the time, you now had the coal fireplaces that had to be lit, but you also had gentlemen who smoked pipes and cigars and they wanted to be able to light these pipes and cigars without having to go to a fire and light a taper and then light the, the uh, smoke. So matches became a, a, a big thing, again, a matter of convenience. And the matches we know it today was actually uh, invented serendipitously by uh, English chemist in 1826. His name was John Walker. And his match happened to, um, he was experimenting with different things, but on a stick he had placed some sulfur, potassium chloride, and antimony trisulfide. And when it happened to brush against uh, some paper, some sandpaper, it caught fire. And so he was selling these in his drugstore at the time, but he never patented it. So another fellow came along, Samuel Jones, and uh, he basically stole the idea and marketed these uh, strike matches as Lucifer's in 1829. And they were a huge hit because now people didn't have to find a fireplace. It's like if you had a cell phone and the battery never died, you didn't have to go find a place to plug it in and recharge. And so uh, the unfortunate thing about this though, in order to have these matches uh, strike and light on anything, they had to be made with something very flammable. And that very flammable substance was white phosphorus. And the white phosphorus 
unfortunately, could make a chemical reaction with the body that led to destruction of the jawbone. And what would happen here is these young women were painting or dipping the tips of these matches, ultimately uh, stacking them together, as you can see here in the photograph, putting them in boxes, handling them, and getting exposed to the white phosphorus. And what would happen is the chemical reaction is such that the white phosphorus mixes with water in saliva or sweat, along with carbon dioxide, just from breathing out, and creates a substance called a biphosphonate that alters bone metabolism. And so these young women, just like the uh, radium girls, were having problems uh, initially with their, their jaws, but also uh, hands could be exposed. And causation was developed for them as well. And so this was called Fossy Jaw nickname for the white phosphorus. It was found all over Europe, wherever white phosphorus was used for matchmaking, as first described in Vienna in 1839, um, and also in New York by Dr. James R. Wood. And this is a picture of a young woman named Cornelia. She worked at the match factory. She was only 16 years old when she developed uh, necrosis of the jaw and an abscess, her teeth fell out, and ultimately her uh, jaw had to be amputated. And sadly, this was done without anesthesia. And after the surgery was done, the wound was cleaned and washed every day with a lead solution, which was thought to be uh, inhibitory of infection for infection and opium for pain relief. So, you know, you can see cosmetically the result is, is pretty good. There's some swelling here. But then Cornelia went back to the factory and she ended up uh, developing more complications of white phosphorus exposure. And you can see here, this is a uh, mandible, a jawbone of another patient who had white phosphorus exposure. You can see that the teeth have all fallen out. Um, and the bone is uh, literally uh, eaten away here. Now, these young women, remember, had no power. They were usually from poor families, whether it be in London or Paris or New York. But in London, they did go on strike in 1888. It was really more symbolic than anything because people still wanted their matches and the company still was gonna produce the matches. And so they could either you know, strike or leave, and no one really cared too much, except the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army took up their cause and built a factory using safer red phosphorus back in 1891. And in order to get people to use these new safety matches, which were a little more expensive, they tried to shame the public into using these safety matches because look if you see the advertisement it says remember the poor match girls and it shows that they were exposed to terrible working condition and so the name of their matches uh, were lights in darkest england fair wages for fair work and it was it was really trying to shift the um, public opinion towards safety matches in an altruistic way now, white phosphorus was actually outlawed by the Berne Convention in 1908, so all of Europe quit uh, using white phosphorus, but not in the United States. White phosphorus was still used in matches until 1925, and it was really not the users of the matches, but those who worked in the match factories that were most uh, prone to that. And again, you might say, why would someone stay and work in a factory where they knew uh, there was harm being done, or even more ethically speaking, why would people buy these matches if they knew that it was done on the backs of these, uh, at the risk of these poor women who were um, stuck in the match factory? And we can say, oh, well, they weren't very altruistic or, or understanding, but if we think about, again, bringing it forward to the 21st century, 
You know, you look at NFL products or even any kind of sports products made by Nike or any of the other companies, you open the cap, look in the inside the cap, and you see that it was made in India, made in Pakistan or Bangladesh, where young girls are working in conditions that probably aren't a lot different from the uh, shops uh, in Dickens' day. So some things really never change. Another interesting uh, exposure was that of mercury poisoning. And although mercury poisoning could be uh, encountered in many different ways, specifically, I want to talk about hat makers. And mercury poisoning in hat makers is just not a 19th century phenomenon. This goes way back because French Huguenots in the 17th century had perfected this technique of using mercury in the felting process. This is a process where the, the uh, fur is taken off the hide and um, prepared in order to make uh, the hat. And so even though mercury, lead, and arsenic poisoning had been known about since ancient times, the French Huguenots kept their secret um, process to themselves because, again, they were artisans and they wanted to pretty much have a monopoly on their trade. Now, hats became very popular during the Victorian and Edwardian, Edwardian periods. Uh, Queen Victoria uh, came on the throne in 1837 died in 1901 uh, to be succeeded by her son, uh, Edward VII. So this whole period of time, uh, hats are very popular. You can look at this uh, diagram here and you can see the tricornate hat of the 18th century. And then you come down here and see all the gentlemen's hats uh, of a later period. Now, unfortunately, those who dealt with mercury would have it absorbed either in the down the respiratory tract or by handling it. And the term mad as a hatter was actually coined in 1829 in Russia. So this was known all throughout Europe. It was just something about hatters after they had worked for a while that they developed personality changes mostly apathy or even a certain shyness they were quick to anger. And it just, it just was something about him that wasn't right. And so people said, oh, yeah, he's as mad as a hatter. And that, that term went throughout Europe and England as well. Now, physicians became concerned over this as a safety hazard. In 1869, the French Academy appealed to uh, uh, legislat legislators to, to do something about it but it was ignored. And in 1898, safety laws were passed in Europe, not in the United States, but they were kind of ignored too. And if you think again about why the hatters didn't want to give up their trade because they were making money off of it and the consumer did not want to give up the hats. So there was no, no impetus to regulate it. Now, interestingly, in the United States, Mercury was used in hat making, and you have to remember, if you've ever watched a Humphrey Bogart movie or any movie from the 30s or 40s, all the guys have on hats. It was a thing, you know, everybody wore hats. So it wasn't until World War II that mercury was no longer used in hats, not because people got aware of the dangers, but because the mercury was needed for detonators for bombs. And so it was... Uh, taken over by the uh, military and an alternative measure uh, uh, was used to make hats. So mercury poisoning, very specific to hat makers, but if you think about it, people were exposed back then in other ways. Uh, methyl mercury uh, was used in dyes. And today we also have mercury in the food chain due to industrial washout into the oceans. The fish have ingested it. And then uh, as each uh, 
animal in the food chain ingests it, then that effect is amplified. So fish like tuna and bass tend to have high levels of mercury and most people should avoid them on a regular basis. Additionally, even up until the 1980s, mercury was used in thermometers, oral thermometers that could break and someone could swallow it. And it was also used in all of the uh, medical thermometers in offices and hospitals. Uh, every hospital room had a wall mount thermometer with mercury in it. And uh, finally, those were removed in the 80s uh, for safety reasons. So we still have that exposure. And still, there, there tends to be that, that apathy uh, about uh, exposure. I think uh, the best 20th uh, century example would be a very serious mercury exposure in Minamata, Japan. Minamata, Japan depended upon uh, the industry there for its livelihood. Almost everyone was employed by this company. And the company threw off their wastewater into a lake that a few of the inhabitants lived nearby. And so they became sick with what we later found out to be mercury poisoning. But at the time it was not known. This was back in the 1950s. The company denied any wrongdoing and physicians made the causation with the runoff. The company denied. And you would think that the other townspeople would have been sympathetic to the plight of those who lived near the wastewater runoff. But instead, they were angry with them and ostracized them because they were afraid that if the company was held liable and it went out of business, then all of them would lose their livelihood. So again, we have the issue of the interest of the victim versus that of the consumer versus that of the company all at play here. Eventually, uh, uh, those who had what uh, was called Minamata disease were compensated uh, for life. There are many of them involved with that. And uh, in Japan, there are some areas where it's still called dancing cat fever because initially they thought it was some sort of infectious disease, but they knew that animals were also affected. And the dancing cat has to do with the neurologic damage done to the cat so that it wouldn't walk properly and sometimes would have seizures and spasm. So what would it do to humans? Well, again, the hat maker was uh, an interesting sort. He was known for irritability, depression, apathy, and a certain shyness. This was repeated over and over again in the literature, but it also affected muscle strength and the mercury uh, would involve the uh, central nervous system with personality changes, hallucinations, tremors, as well as reddish fingers and toes. Now, in the United States, the medical associations did a survey on American felters, which are what hatters were called here, and found that about 80% of them had what was felt to be mercurial tremors. But the trade unions didn't want to address it because it would threaten their livelihood and they attributed this instead to a likely high alcohol consumption uh, by hatters leading to these tremors. Unions at the time were more concerned about tuberculosis and not to minimize the danger of tuberculosis in close workspaces, but it's interesting that a disease like tuberculosis would get immediate attention whereas a chronic disease like mercury poisoning would not. And the reason was that tuberculosis would kill the, the worker or make, him, make it impossible for him to work and support his family, whereas chronic mercury poisoning, they could still go on and, and um, earn their livelihood. So a little bit of apathy on the part of the worker as well. All right, well, this is the most interesting one, I think. Arsenic, again, known for centuries as a poison, but somehow 
overlooked in 19th century fashion. Orpiment was used in the tanning industry to remove hair from hides. So if you worked in textiles, you're going to have arsenic exposure. It was used very commonly as rat poison. And it could also be used easily to commit the perfect murder because it's odorless and tasteless. And back in the day, in the 19th century in London, quite a few women were uh, put on trial for having poisoned their husband's tea because the arsenic was particularly soluble in hot liquids. And so uh, hot tea was the perfect medium through which to slowly poison someone that you didn't want to be with. Arsenic was also used in dyes, especially green dye. And amazingly, it was also used to color sugar for the bakers to make attractive uh, cakes and things. And it was used in textiles such as wallpaper and uh, clothing materials. And this is sort of scary, but in the 19th century, flour was expensive. And so those selling flour also wanted to increase their profit margin. Arsenic was cheap. It was a byproduct of, of uh, most uh, uh, mining uh, of ores. And so it looked just like flour. And so they put a lot of it in there. And so they didn't have to sell as much flour and they could increase their, their um, uh, profit margin. So nearly everybody in the 19th century, if you were to take a hair or fingernail sample, you'd probably find much higher arsenic levels than you would find today. In Victorian England, a change was occurring though. Candlelight was no longer being used to light homes. Gas lighting was being used and this burned brighter than candles therefore clothing could be better seen so if you wanted to be better seen if you wanted to be uh if you wanted to stand out and and uh promote your social status you wanted brighter clothes to display and this is how we came about with something called shields green variants called paris green or emerald emerald green they were popular for clothing, paint, and use in wallpaper. And Shields Green actually was invented by a uh, Swedish chemist who worked in the dye industry back in 1775. And then uh, in Schweinfurt, Germany, uh, they developed another type of green uh, that started in the 19th century. And so all these different type of green, it was a fad. People just went uh, crazy over this green and use it for everything it was in clothing it was in makeup it was in wallpaper back in the 19th century hand painted wallpaper was also very popular so you had the pattern that was printed on there and then artisans went back behind that and painted little birds or or uh, little designs within the paper so green was the operative word here and this is what it looked like. Unfortunately, the green was full of arsenic. There was enough ar arsenic in this dress to kill the wearer. And people died from their clothing. Arsenic entered the body through the skin. And so how did that happen? Well, it was leached out of the clothes, either if the woman got caught in the rain or if she sweated that would leach the arsenic out of the clothes and the patients would start to feel ill. Uh, nausea was very common, weakness, uh, just, just they didn't feel right. And those are such nonspecific complaints. It could have been due to many things. And often the doctor would uh, tell the patient, well, you're, you're tired, you need to go take to the bed and rest for a while. And so the woman's resting in the same bedroom where the arsenic wallpaper is on the wall. And this is what the arsenic wallpaper looked like. It's really quite beautiful. And this again has to do with what was in vogue at the time. There was a very famous artisan poet, um, politician, celebrity by the name of Willa, William Morris. 
and he was the spokesman for the arts and crafts era uh, back in the 19th century. And he refused to believe that his beautiful wallpaper or designs had something potentially toxic in them. And he protested and actually most of the public didn't believe that it was toxic. Most of the public thought, I want this green, I want it for my dress, I want to look good. And again, it was a mark of social status if you had these colors or this wallpaper in, in your home. Now, the backstory on William Morris is interesting in that he was heir to a copper mine. And when they mined for the copper ore, they got all of this arsenic out and he was using that arsenic in his paints. So he had to have known, uh, like so many companies, there's this level of denial, either uh, out of fear of loss of his, his standing in the community or because of fear of liability. Anyway, uh, expressions came from this. Newspapers used to uh, published satirical cartoons of skeletons dressing in green dressings uh, dresses having a good time saying that you know they were in killer dresses well the term killer uh, outfits became a thing in victorian england if uh your suitor came to see you and you were dressed in a beautiful dress he'd say wow that's a killer outfit saying that it was as beautiful as these beautiful green dresses that allegedly were uh, causing harm to people. So <laughs> you even got slang out of this. Now, the problem is, though, that the more popular it became, the more people died. And the sad thing is babies died in their nurseries because if you were well off, you put the money into the nursery and the wallpaper was all hand painted and the baby wore this, these fancy clothes so you could show the baby off. And these babies died. Now, many babies died. They died of uh, other things. Even in the 20th century, they died of infection. They died of fevers. So it was hard to you know, pinpoint that they actually died of arsenic. However, eventually the British Medical Journal began to sway opinion. And the physicians in Britain wrote an article saying that arsenic is leading to the slow poisoning of Great Britain through the garments that are being worn. Now it was primarily women because the men generally didn't wear green garments. So the British Medical Journal uh, was able to sway some opinions, but the, what really ended it was not that people said, oh, this is dangerous, we're, we're not going to do it. In 1895, an alternative to arsenic was developed to create the same bright colors. And so it was less expensive and people said, oh, well, it's probably, uh, they say the other thing is poisonous, so let's go with this new product. So. Uh, new was better, and so arsenic went the way of uh, history, at least with respect to clothing. Now, I want to say a, a couple of things about this. Again, you might say, oh, how could these people be so uh, resistant to the facts, to the scientific fact that arsenic was killing people when they knew arsenic killed rats? They knew the material had arsenic in it, or at least that's what scientific publications uh, showed. Why would they still do it? Why would they still refuse to believe science? Well, you don't have to go any further than our current situation here in the United States, where we have a vaccine available for COVID, but people don't believe that it would work or they don't believe COVID exists. Uh, or they think it's some conspiracy, just like the the uh, William Morris felt like people were the the doctors were just trying to take away his his uh, fame as being the the number one uh, uh, textile artisan of the day. So again, human nature. Now. Along these same lines, I have to talk about morning clothes. Not clothes you wear in the morning, but clothes that women used to wear, and to some extent men. They usually just wore an armband, but the women went full mourning. Why? Because usually the men died first. And so the women went into mourning. 
there were hazards in this. There were hazards of crepe. And when you're talking about C-R-E-P-E -E for morning clothes, it's actually spelled C-R-A-P-E, -E, which I didn't know until I was doing research for this presentation. Now, in the 19th century, mourning was a social rite of passage. Everybody did it. If you didn't do it, you were ostracized. It was a ritual lasting 2.5 years for women, and it occurred in three stages. The first mourning stage lasted a year and a day, and during this time, the woman could not wear anything but black, could not wear jewelry, could not go out, etc., etc., this custom displayed the widow's piety and reaffirmed her class position. And you say, well, that's just ridiculous. Well, you have to remember in the 19th century, there was an age of sentimentality. You also had the Crimean War in 1854. So many uh, British soldiers were killed. Queen Victoria lost her husband, Prince Albert, in 1861, and she went into mourning and stayed in it until she died in 1901, and so she was well-respected, and so people wanted to emulate her. And in the United States, the American Civil War between 1861 and 1865 led to millions of casualties, so you had lots of women emulating the mourning dress of Queen Victoria. Much of what Queen Victoria did in England was quickly emulated through fashion magazines here in the United States. Black crepe veil was a thing. The face was to be fully covered. It was six feet long and hung down in the back. The purpose of it was to hide her face so that she could, quote, weep with propriety. And it also, quote, protected against the untimely gaiety, their spelling, of a passing stranger. Now, the other thing about morning clothes is they couldn't be satiny. They couldn't be lustrous or iridescent. They had to be flat colored, opaque. Well, this was very convenient for manufacturers because they could make these veils out of cheap silk dyed with aniline and processed with arsenic and benzene, all of which are either caustic or carcinogens. And they used a mordant to set it made of chromium. Now, the dye would leach out with sweating or rain, and these women were developing sores, respiratory problems, and in some cases, even blindness as a result of their mourning dress. Now, Industry catered to this ingrained social custom. Stores carried entire departments devoted to morning clothes. So if you went in the store, you could find the morning section. One of the largest stores to, to um, promote this was Lord & Taylor in the United States. And uh, in England, uh, a store by the name of Cortals was the largest morning supplier in the world between 1850 and 1885, which is also a time of many wars. And their return on the morning dress was 30%. So they used cheap silk, cheap products, but everybody bought it because they, they had to. It was part of social custom. And so they made millions off of this. And you can see these two young women, they look like kids. But they would be in this full morning dress for a year and a day, and then you could go into regular morning, which are dark colors, but not black, and then half morning, where things got uh, a little less um, restrictive during the last part of that uh, two and a half year period. And you might say, oh, this is absolutely ridiculous. I would not do this. I, it served no useful purpose. Remember, customs and fitting in is super important to everybody, whether you're a teenager or whether you're trying to, again, maintain your social status. And if you don't think that's the case, just think about bridal gowns and bridesmaids dresses and everything is matched. And, and you know, it, it, if someone's going to have a big typical wedding, the bride is not going to show up in a yellow dress or a pink dress. It's going to be the specific attire for that wedding. 
Ironically, the white wedding dress is also a product of Queen Victoria. Before she married Prince Albert in 1841, I think it was, women were married in any color dress. But once Queen Victoria married in the white dress, it became the uh, established attire for that particular event. And finally, we're going to finish up with lead poisoning, also known as plumbism, from the uh, Latin word for lead and the uh, uh, periodic table of the elements, the symbol for lead is PB, for plum. This goes way back. You know, lead poisoning was described by Vitruvius, Caesar's architect. It was in the Roman pipes. We know that a lead poisoning uh, or lead exposure affects the central nervous system, especially in children whose nervous system is rapidly growing. And the way it interferes uh, is that it affects DNA transcription and interferes with enzymes that uh, act uh, can act uh, uh, affecting other metals that the body needs. It also affects heme in making of the red blood cell. It's found everywhere in contaminated soil, water, lead paint, dust chips, gasoline. But if we go back prior to the 19th century, we know that a lot of exposure in painters was in lead white. This was a specific type of oil paint that was the white that Caravaggio used, Van Gogh used, uh, they even think Caravaggio and perhaps Van Gogh died of lead poisoning because he seemed to have such an irritable temperament and they thought it was related to perhaps lead poisoning. But interestingly, lead poisoning, while it did affect everyone, it also affected members of the upper class all the way back to Roman times, but certainly in the 19th century. Why? Because lead acetate was used to sweeten wine. It was called the sugar of lead. And so wealthy people developed what was called Saturnine gout. Uric acid that causes gout built up in their systems, but it was because the lead damaged the kidneys so that the kidneys could not excrete uric acid. So this Saturnine gout actually turned out to be um, the disease of kings, because it was recognized that kings and other wealthy people developed gout, and so it was considered kind of a, a status symbol. But it also affected the poor, the plumbers, and cheap 18th century rum was made in lead stills, and so poor people got it too. Now, in the 19th century, lead house paint was developed. And fortunately, it was banned by the League of Nations in 1922, but because the United States didn't belong to the League of Nations, it wasn't banned in the United States until 1978. So lead poisoning still continues to be a major problem. Lead toxicity and the Saturnine gout that came from it was such a status symbol that people drew pictures of it. This is uh, Gil Ray, who was a satirist. Uh, this was from 1799. He drew the artist's rendition of what gout looks like as the joint becomes very inflamed due to deposition of uric acid crystals. And they even made ceramics that one could display in one's home, uh, commiserating with other wealthy people about your Saturnine gout. Now, I want to finish up by saying that this is a huge public health issue, and I think all of you are probably familiar with the Flint water crisis that began in 2014 when the Flint water system began using water from the Flint River and uh, lead was leached out and thousands of kids were exposed uh, and, and possibly have developed a lead poisoning from that. So that's still an ongoing issue. Now, we're... Uh, we're at time, but I just want to uh, let you know that should you take this course, or if you're just uh, visiting uh, French Quarter in New Orleans, the historic New Orleans Pharmacy Museum has many of these potions and patent remedies on display uh, that are both interesting and frightening to think, again, that uh, people did actually use these things in the interest of health 
and hopefully they survive their own medical treatments. So again, I, I thank you very much. And uh, we have time probably for just a couple of questions if anyone would like to ask. Thank you, Alma. Yeah, I, I'm Stephen Hansen. Uh, I'm the Director of Graduate Studies in the Master's Program, and I would welcome any questions in the chat um, or uh, if you simply wanted to unmute and ask. I have a, a related question related to uh, what was what that uh, medicine that uh, a lot, it's, it's, they talk about it a lot in a lot of Western movies that the women would take. Uh, that lauded, lauded, I'm not sure what it was. There was a um, laudatum, uh, the liquid medication that the women quite often took. Uh, well, there's also something called Lydia Pinkman's remedy. Could that be what you're talking about? Lauded, laud, what do they call it? Lauded? Laudatum is a extract of opium that I was used so. for everything. Yeah, so that was used as a. Uh, so it was opium then that they would get because uh, they get addicted to that stuff too is that the yes. same as laudanum yeah la yes yeah, that's, what, that's what i was talking about is that it yes and they even gave that to babies for teething yeah i remember that too <laughs> thanks very nice presentation thank you Great, thanks for you in the in the chat. Any further questions? I mean, I have one, if I might. Um, you spoke of the lack of concern that individuals show uh, for uh, people with these particular industrial uh, diseases because they, I guess, feared that the, 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 they would lose jobs in the area. Um, I mean, I, we see that now, right? I mean, when I was, when, so not that many years ago when I was in Lake Charles, that there is always a fear that the chemical companies that are one of the major em employers in Lake Charles, Louisiana will move an hour and a half down the line to Texas if Texas offers them better deals. So we can't put any restrictions on uh, you know, what, what the companies can do. Did you see any, that, that it's not just individuals uh, and human nature saying we don't want to lose our jobs, but that also being perhaps pushed by the, the companies uh, involved? Oh, absolutely. I think there's very little difference in the, the mindsets of 19th century and the 21st century when it comes to uh, just the way human nature responds to things. And I've kind of I'll put that here. I, I don't want to use up too much time, but cultural trends in the industries, they're dependent upon one another. And so industries are there to maximize profit, but the consumer is there to get what they want. And consumers will buy products they desire, even if the ethics and safety of the production are questionable. And that's an ethical issue. And then adherence to social expectations is a stronger force than warnings based on science. And that a COVID vaccine right there. And finally, I guess, uh, as the the ethical bent to this discussion, it's it's really to approach an ethical problem. I really think it's necessary to understand the culture from which it arises, because simply to say, you know, patient X just they should know better than that. They shouldn't do that. Well, there's a whole backstory there, and that that patient's actions have everything to do with how they fit into that society and their livelihood and their the power that they have to exert or don't have to exert. Thank you. Well, if there are no further questions, I'd like to uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And uh, if anyone has any other questions that come up later, please feel free to email me at eledoux at tulane.edu. You have a good afternoon. Thank you so much, Alma. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ledoux.